1 in 3 is intended for mature audiences. Episodes contain explicit content and may be triggering as they often include violence and other varying forms of abuse such as emotional, psychological, sexual, and physical. In most cases, names have been changed to protect all involved. Please note, statements and opinions of guests do not necessarily reflect those of my own. Hi, Warriors. Welcome to One in Three. I'm your host, Ingrid. Today, I have another survivor-turned-warrior episode for you. A. Garcia shares pieces of her lifelong experience with domestic violence. The conversation flows easily as we intermix insight into what can be done to stop DV. As usual, we had a lot to speak about, so I'm breaking this into two episodes. Here is part one with A. Garcia. Okay, good morning. Today I have A. Garcia with me. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you for having me. And I don't know if you want to give a little brief introduction before. I know you and I are going to talk a lot. And so I don't know if you want to give a quick little background of how, well, we don't have to talk about how we got introduced to each other because that's a long tale itself. (laughs) (laughs) But um, if you want to give a background of what you're doing and, and, and whatever else you want to share. Sure. Thank you. Um, More than likely, I have a feeling we're going to talk more about what's happening today and what's going on now. So I'll just share a brief background of, you know, my life and why I'm here on your show. You know, one out of three, you know, one out of three is the true statistics of, you know, women that have either, you know, been exposed to or actually experiencing a form of domestic violence you know, uh, the needle hasn't moved for decades. We've been fighting for rights and, you know, the severity of, of, of this topic for centuries since 1641. Okay. Um, and so now for <clears throat> the statistics to be the needle to have moved those statistics since COVID, by the way, not sure if you're aware of that COVID was a, our domestic violence was a pandemic in within the pandemic. It definitely moved that needle forward. Uh, one out of four men are now um, a part of or exposed to or have experienced a form of domestic violence. So one out of three for the women, one out of four for the men, right? That's pretty significant. So um, <clears throat> for me personally, I will say that domestic violence was a part of my life for a very long time. Um, unfortunately, I was born into it per se. I didn't know anything different uh, or anything better. And throughout life, you know, it wasn't until I had my, my first child as teenager that I was like, Oh my gosh, this is not what I want for my kid. This is not what the life I'm going to give. This is not the environment I'm going to provide. And it's so weird on how that was just like a switch it was just a switch. I don't know how or why or what, but I knew when I was bringing another human being into this world, I was not going to share the life I had. It was going to be a different one. And so I've just, like I said, I was born into it. My, my, my mother was in an abusive relationship. So there was this gestational trauma that I experienced before I even came into the world. And the the situation, the environment was bad enough for her that when she left, she packed her bags and left. She didn't take her kids. And so after we were abandoned, I say me because I had a, a, a younger sister at the time, a year after she left, uh, my sister passed away. So now it's just me and my dad, right? In the environment that my mother left. And, you know, here he just lost his baby you know, so his coping skills were not the best. You know, he worked third shift and slept all day and we had nothing, <laughs> no relationship, no bond, no connection, no nothing. So, you know, I, I did have some aunts that stepped up and stepped in for quite some time. And then it was, you know, the streets. I resorted to the streets. That's where I had friends. That's where I had fun. That's where I was, you know, very occupied. I, as a little girl, without having any type of, you know, counseling or knowledge around this stuff, I sought different things to take up my time. I wanted to be anywhere but home. So I was at any after school gig. I was at the recreation park. I was doing anything and everything but to be home. 
So by teenage years, um, you know, first puppy love, it was very abusive. We were fist fighting on the floor, on the street, anywhere, everywhere. Uh, you know, I didn't know any better. That's how, it's what I understood. So again, when I had my daughter, that's when, you know, life changed. Uh, we, we separated after she was a, maybe three months. It was that fast. Um, you know, he got, he turned to the streets. I was not about that. It, you know, I don't want to go too far into that, down that rabbit hole, but I can tell you that the abuse did not stop just because we separated. I had my daughter on a little, you know, big wheel, uh, outside going up and down the block. And he showed up with a car, grabbed her, threw her in the car and took off. And me, I'm running after the car. I jump on the hood. It's like a movie. He's swerving back and forth. And you see my body all over the hood. I'm like, call the police. Whoever can hear me that's outside. I mean, it was the most ridiculous thing. By the time he was able to get me off the car, my shoes were like, like threads and I'm running back home, running back home. It wasn't for about a mile. By the time I got home, thank goodness somebody had actually heard me, saw the situation, called the cops. They were there. You know, I, I shared everything. Uh, they went to go, you know, obviously to the house and get my daughter and bring her back. But it's like, it is, it was just nonstop. So, you know, I suppose we can start there, right. For these young ladies, and young men that are that are in high school that are that are dating that are feeling like home isn't where they're feeling loved or being heard or being seen or having this like connection that you know is yearned for in in that in that puberty stage or that you know transition from adolescence into you know teenage years or young adulthood and you know there's so much that we think we want but we don't realize what we're entering and there's a lot of, you know, I don't want to say literature, but a lot of, um, a lot of information out there that can be sought if you are feeling like you love somebody as, you know, in this teenage relationship, but you're sad all the time still, or you're feeling like this person has some sort of control over you. And you're feeling like, hold on a second. Why do I feel like I have a third parent or somebody dictating who I can talk to or where I can go or what I'm wearing or, you know, nowadays it's all about social media, right? Don't be friends with them. Don't follow them. You know, give me your password. Give me your location. You know, these are all flags. These are all flags. You're absolutely right. And I think that's where, you know, if we ever were to truly stop domestic violence, we have to prevent it. And I think that's what's super important, especially in the youth who maybe are coming from homes where that's what they think is the normal. And that's what's so important about education and people talking about what's happened is so that you understand this isn't like love should not hurt. You know, you shouldn't be sad in your relationship all the time. It shouldn't physically hurt. So I think you're absolutely right with that. And I think, I think maybe that's where, maybe that's where, you know, we hone in a little bit is like, what is the definition of hurt? You know, sometimes in my personal opinion, it can be not even hurt. It could be all of this like confusion and the doubts. You don't even realize you're hurt yet. You're just wondering like, why, why am I feeling a certain way or believing a certain thing? Why am I convinced or why am I just so full of doubt that I'm so confused and I don't even know who I am anymore or, or what I'm doing or where I'm going? I think that that is maybe a little more prominent in those teenage years than the the, the crying and the sadness. I agree because, you know, in those teenage years, just without being in a bad relationship, just being a teenager, you're trying to figure out yourself. You don't know, you don't know, like, why am I feeling this way? What is going on? And that's just a normal part of being a teenager and hormones happening. So it is <laughs> right. And it's, it's makes it so much more difficult there to, you know, everybody talks about red flags and green flags, and it's hard to determine then, well, is this really a red flag or is this just, is that normal behavior? and reactions. And I love that you're saying that because <laughs> um, red flags, are they yours or are they theirs? 
<laughs> right. Exactly. Exactly. Right? And and not to be, you know, I, I just I want to be very transparent. I like to keep it raw and real. And, you know, it's 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 a fact what I'm about to share, um, you know, because I, I worked with women that did this for a very long time in her life. And she said, you know, violence in teenage years actually increases around the time of the menstrual cycle. So what you were saying earlier as it relates to, you know, those hormones being a bit out of control, you know, in those teenage years, it's happening on both sides, right? For the boys and the girls, they're both going through their hormonal changes. And we know even as grown women, sometimes it's out of control. We cannot control. <laughs> um, yes. <laughs> so can you imagine it's almost like this perfect storm you know, where, where the boys becoming the young man and they're feeling, you know, that testosterone pounding on their chest and you don't know where they're coming from with in their home. And then you have, you know, the girl becoming that young woman and they're just like, they can't control how they're feeling. And if they're feet, if they are feeling intimidated or bullied or pushed around, trust me, at some point, like a cat being cornered, we're going to scratch back or what they say, clap back. Right. So, <laughs> So it's like, if I well, just want to say that I, I personally believe in my very strong opinion, and I want to figure out on how to do something about this, you know, when they're teaching sex ed in school, when they're teaching about, you know, puberty and they're teaching about these things, this is the time to talk about domestic violence. This is the time to talk about what, you know, consent is. This is the time to talk about the feelings that come with all of these changes that you're going through. And I don't understand why this is not like every single year in high school, you know, a required course. Or even just a required speaker. I remember being in, I mean, it was a long time ago that I was in high school, but I remember being in high school <laughs> and we would have random speakers about different things. I think we had someone about drunk driving or something along those lines. Uh, it was, I know dare was a big thing back. See, that's how long ago it was, you know, Nancy Reagan and her dare, or was it dare? Or was it moms against whatever her right. little, mad. yeah, you mad. That's what it was. Um, so that, that was the whole platform then. And I know we had a lot of presentations and speakers coming to talk to us about this. This would be a good opportunity to have someone come and, you know, maybe not give terribly gruesome details of things, but gruesome enough to really hit home and tie that in to like what you said, you're, you're doing sex education anyway. Let's talk about consent. Let's talk about what yes means, what no means, what no looks like. I mean, no doesn't have to be somebody actually saying no, no could be incapacitated and you can't say no, you know, thing, things along that line. I think that would be a great idea to incorporate yeah. that into the oh education. Yeah. Let's, let's look into it and see what we need to do. To let's it. do it. Let's do it. <laughs> yeah. And you know, I think that what you said earlier as it relates to like the gruesomeness, right? Like I totally agree. Let's not put that fear factor in them and show them like, you know, the worst case scenario, but just something that's like eye opening to the point where these statistics that we're talking about one out of three, one out of four, we could just ask them, Hey, you know, whether it's you yourself or somebody that, you know, or a family or friend or whatever the case, how many of you have seen or have known heard or been a part of DV. And then let's see the, the, the hand, how many hands go up. That alone would be like, boom, eye opening. Super powerful. Right. Yeah. Or if you haven't think of how many women do you know, how many females do you know in your life out of those females, one in three of them. So if you don't know, you have no idea what somebody's going through behind, you know, these beautiful social media posts and these perfect lives that everybody is presenting. You have no idea. Oh, I saw something the other day. I loved it. It was this beautiful red shining apple with this like glimmer of the light, you know, just gleaming off the side of it. And then the camera was like going around to the other side of the apple and it was so freaking rotten that you would never even pick it up. <laughs> okay. That's so, perfect. Yeah. 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 It's this persona, right? It's like, oh yeah, this is great, great, great. You know, which is 
unfortunately, what happens as you kind of grow up and you get into adulthood and then you have these, you know, predators, I'll call them, that dress up all nice and shiny with a beautiful title and cleans up and then they, you know, are not that on the inside. And that is especially important when you have somebody coming from a broken home and now here's this knight in shining armor to rescue you from your tragedies and then they end up being a bigger monster. Oh my gosh, that sounds like you know me very well because I think I have <laughs> a times <laughs> in my life. I, I mean, I shared with you, you know, what my childhood was. So mm-hmm. I believe that my partners in the past thought that I was weak, that I was vulnerable, that I was easy to, you know, get over, step on or abuse because I came from such a freaking broken home. And what they didn't realize was that, you know, because I had to navigate and fight my way through my own childhood to basically, you know, provide for myself. Um, I was the total opposite. I was the strongest woman they've ever met in their, in their life. And, you know, I preferred to, and have, you know, um, been homeless than to be in the home where it was a very toxic, abusive environment. And I think that's a general misconception of domestic violence victims in, in, I think I already said general in general, because you think, well, you you can only be a victim if you're weak or if there's something and and that's not the case. It, there's a wide variety of reasons, abusers, and I do feel they choose certain people and it's not because they're weak or I know I can, they can't think for themselves or they're uneducated or whatever. You know, perhaps it's because they know they are strong and this is a person who would fight for a relationship and would do whatever it takes to make something work. So perhaps that's why they choose this individual. Oh my gosh. You are again, hitting the the nail on the head. I think that we should probably take some time to really talk about those different layers of people because it's important for everyone to know, you know, where they are in their life And to listen, I'm going to be a little confusing right now just because there's too many things in my head that I'm trying to say. I didn't learn until I was in my 40s this one thing that I should have asked everybody in my life. And it's because I was asked the question. And that is, what's your angle? And when that person asked me that question, I was just silent for so long because I didn't have an angle. I didn't even know how to answer that question, let alone try to break down or interpret the question. And then I realized, oh my gosh, if I would have just asked that question to this list of people in my brain, you know, I probably would have seen these flags we were talking about a little while ago a lot sooner. So sometimes what you were saying just a moment ago, you know, when this person is strong and they know that they'll fight for the relationship. So then that's who they go for. Yeah, you're absolutely, you're absolutely correct. And why? Because maybe that's the challenge. Maybe that's what they feel that they need to, you know, Unfortunately, this is, you know, the sad case of the abusive behaviors that we're here to talk about, but that's the challenge so that that strong person cannot be broken down. I was able to conquer that. I was able to, I was able to break that down and take control. Right. I completely agree. You're the, you're the next challenge. Yeah. Yeah. You know, or it could be what we talked about earlier where it's like, oh yeah, they came from a broken home. They just need to be told how beautiful they are and how much they're loved. Oh, it makes me want to vomit. <laughs> right. So, you know, and then and then there's people with titles, right? Just just because they're president, you know, male or female, they have this great title or they're known in the community or they have this beautiful status that's like, oh my gosh. You know, it's almost like having fans, right? Like as if there's some sort of celebrity and, you know, on both sides. Anyways, um, and then that becomes the challenge. It's just to have the clout. It's just to be that, yeah, I'm with so-and-so to have that title, right? And 
that title could also be a manipulator to go after and get whatever is, you know, desired. Absolutely. I think, you know, maybe it just boils down to you have something that they want. Yes. You know, and, and that's what they're going for. And that's what they're trying. And it, and like you said, it could be power. It could be intelligence. It could be whatever strength. And they want that. They don't have that themselves. So they want that. And yeah. that's why you're the challenge. I wanted to say, you know, maybe asking you, like, what is your angle that, you know what, that it twists it now. To yep. where it's it's a you thing. It's not yeah. a me thing. It's not, you know, that's yep. so interesting. Yeah. Sneaky. And then, yeah. And I think if there's a knee jerk answer and it sounds so good, then they were, it was premeditated. They were, they, they have that answer already somewhere up their sleeve. Because if there's really nothing there or there's like, you know, something that's very specific, you know, I don't, I, I don't know. It's like, this is, it's a good test. Where are they? Are they, are they going to be honest? You'll be able to pick it up. I think there's so many layers to really, you know, take apart in that question and in that response, L- seeing how long it takes for them to respond. What is that answer? You know? Yeah. Because like, as you're saying that I was sitting here, I'm like, what if somebody, I have no idea what I would answer because I don't, I'm just me, you know, I don't know (laughs) what, there's no angle. I don't get what that even, I don't even know how I could answer that. Exactly. Yeah. And, you know, I think that, you know, I'm going to be a little biased here. That's probably more so on the women's side because we don't have that angle. I'm not saying, you know, I'm not speaking for all of us. There are some abusive women out there that definitely have an angle. They just want to level themselves up, use whoever they want to get, juice them is what I call it, you know, and then move on to the next and see who else they can juice. You know, that's just a real thing. Um, you know, but we won't go down that road right now. <laughs> I love that term, juice them. That's great. Yeah, and it is both ways, you know, but, you know, um, I, I, I was able to work with someone else in the past that said they, you know, asked several men, when was the last time you were in fear for your life? And, you know, really it took more up to like five minutes to answer. And it was like, you know, something from childhood, you know, but then when you ask a woman, when was the last time you were in fear for your life? You know, the answers are immediate. I was at, when I was at the grocery store, when I was going for a walk, you know, like it, there really is fear that is within us every single day in society, you know, alone. So when we feel like we are emotionally attached and we are in a trusting relationship and there is vulnerability there and, and then we start getting chipped away and chipped away and chipped away mentally, emotionally, financially, you know, and sometimes physically and sexually, spiritually, you know, that type of abuse, I think is very, much more long-term and detrimental to us as it relates to healing and coping than that physical, you know, abuse. I agree. And not to downplay physical abuse because it's horrific. But if somebody comes up to you, you know, you're in a relationship, you've gone on two dates and they they punch you in the face. Oh, whoa, what's going on here? You know, and you know, hopefully that's a big enough wake up call that you're you're out of there. But Uh, I just, um, I don't know if the Netflix has a documentary series and I actually just did kind of a a quick episode that I posted, um, just going over what my thoughts were. I didn't redo the stories because they did, it was great stories. Um, but one of them, they were married and it was just emotional, not just, but it was emotional, psychological abuse, controlling behavior for years. They were married, they had kids and years later he punched her. And, you know, so when you get to that, she, that was enough for her, which a lot of times that's not, you excuse it away. You think, well, okay, you know, he or she was drinking or they had a really bad day that day. So they've never been physical before, but they've been laying that groundwork, that emotional and psychological abuse where they're, like you said, they're taking you apart piece by piece to where now you doubt yourself. You're not that strong person that came into the relationship. And I, I think of myself, like I turned into a shell of, of what I used to be. I was just like this little shell before it got physical. And it, I didn't have any of my strengths to fall back on, you know, at that point. And I think that's, 
really important is to recognize the subtlety of abuse and that long-term effect of the, 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 the mind, the mental abuse, because that's where you don't see it. And I was actually, I was just speaking to somebody about this. It was, it's almost like this teeny tiny little virus that stays there in your brain. It, they put it there and now it's stuck there and you can encapsulate it and put it aside and ignore it. But if you ignore it, it, it can fester and it can grow and it can explode on you with no idea that it's even coming. So you have to know it's there. You have to, you don't want to nurture it. You don't want it to grow, but you, you have to like keep it, keep it in check and recognize it and say, okay, I know I had this trauma. It's been sitting there. I know going forward into this situation, I may have this reaction. I might have these feelings. Those feelings are okay. That reaction's okay. But, you know, I don't know. It's it's a very difficult place to get to. And I mean, therapy for, for sure helps and having good, strong support system helps, but not everybody has that. So, you know, what do those people do? You don't have the financial means to get, I mean, it's a lot of money to see therapy, a therapist. And yeah. So like, how do you, how, how do you get past that? How do you, how do you fix that? You can go to the hospital for a broken arm and they'll fix it. Um, but how that, that mental and emotional, those scars are deep and not even necessarily recognizable right away. That's right. And you know, um, I'm going to take what you just said as an opportunity to share a little bit more about me and my, my story. Um, I just gave a little bit of background in the beginning, but the, the, the story here where it gets hot and heavy and all that kind of stuff. I'm just kidding. (laughs) Um, you know, after, after I had, you know, my daughter as teenager and I, you know, broke it off with the dad, the donor, I call him. And, uh, you know, all that drama that led up until, you know, he finally left, he left, he left the city, he left the state, he got himself in enough trouble that he needed to go. So I was like, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I do not need to co-parent. I can do my own thing and whatever. Right. But did I get child support? No. Did he make phone calls to get to know his daughter? No. Did he ever call to see how I was doing, how she was doing, if there was any help that was ever needed to make sure that she was okay? No. Fine. No problem. Okay. So I go back to school. I get my GED. I go to college like the day after, literally they came in and they said, tomorrow's the last day to register for college for all of you GED student graduates. I said, I was in line. All right. So, um, I got to the place where I had my own apartment that was right across the street from where my, where my daughter went to school. And then two blocks, three blocks down was the babysitter and three blocks. The other direction was my job. So even if my car broke down, my daughter would be at the babysitter and make it to school on time. And I will make it to work on time and be able to pick her up from school when the bell rings. Okay. That is how on lock I had it. Now, feeling independent on top of the world. You can't tell me anything. I got it down to a science. Woo, woo, right. And then here comes Mr. Wright in the shining armor. Right. So <laughs> here I am thinking I got my life together. So, you know, you, you attract what you are, you know, this was before Facebook and all that stuff. So there was no real, like, you know, let me see what you're about type of thing. Let me see your background. So anyways, I ended up, um, pregnant with my second child and he was offered a job all the way across, you know, the other side of the States. And I was like, okay, you know, I shared with you my childhood when, you know, when you are born into, you know, a not so great neighborhood and that is your life, uh, getting out of that is, you know, like you're making it right. You're out. Yes. You're successful. Well, (laughs) I'm still questioning that to, to this day. What does making it mean? Right. So, Long story short, um, he was offered the opportunity. I said, yes, he went first. I would, I waited until my daughter was on spring vacation. I finished my semester. I voluntarily left my job, packed all my stuff, took the road trip. Okay. I was seven months pregnant taking that road trip. And so when we got to, you know, our place, uh, you know, I was just more so focused on getting to know the neighborhood, getting to know who my new doctors were going to be, getting my daughter into the school. She didn't even miss a day because I did this during her spring vacation. Okay. 
And so our belongings arrived about three weeks after we did. So while I'm unpacking, getting all, you know, our stuff kind of settled in, I'm in this nesting period now. I'm, you know, on my eighth month of pregnancy here. Um, <clears throat> I have found belongings of another woman. So when the donor, not I call him, got, gets home, I waited until, you know, uh, dinner was done, homework was done, the home was cleaned up, and my daughter was sleeping. And I said to him, I found belongings of another woman while I was putting my stuff away and I would like to know what the heck is going on here. And he said, you're going through my stuff. I said, no, I'm not going through my, through your stuff. I'm putting my stuff away as I'm unpacking. And while I was doing that, I found the belongings of another woman. And before I could finish my sentence, he had already backhand or not backhanded, but like hit me to the floor and sat on my stomach and with his left hand around my neck, he's with his right hand, closed fist, punching, punching, punching to the head. And I don't know what the heck I'm doing, squirming, making noises. I don't know. And then I hear my daughter's voice at the top of the stairs. Mom, mom. I never heard her voice in that scared tone ever. And all of a sudden, it rang to my ears, to the center of my core heart being. And I said, that's my daughter. And I slammed my feet on the, on the flat on the ground. And I pushed my hips to the ceiling to have him roll off of me. I popped up on my feet. I don't have no idea how I ran around the couch. She was already taking that last step off that stair. I grabbed her by her little hand. We ran out the front door, which was right there by the couch, barefoot and in pajamas. And that was the first time he ever was physical. And that was the first time he was ever physical. And I purposefully, I purposefully had an argument, like a big argument with him before we even left where we were both from, because I needed to see where his temper was, what his, you know, and it's not that I was worried about it. This was actually like an advice from my friend, which I took. <laughs> so there was no sign of abusive behaviors of any sort, because I would have never even entertained moving and leaving my life behind if I knew that there was an inkling of something like that that was going to happen. Okay. So I don't, I, we're not going to, for the sake of time, I'm not going to go too deep into like those moments after and, and all that kind of stuff. What I can tell you is that, you know, that was almost 20 years ago. Okay. And so from those 20 years, I never went back home. Okay. I, you do not let me, let's talk about some safety things here. I was able to call the police that evening and he was taken away. All right. I didn't know what the, what the laws were. Cause it was a brand new state that I was in I, county, all that. I didn't know he was going to get out in two hours where I'm from Chicago. The year out in two hours, that's nothing. Slap on the hands, go, go, go. You know where I, I didn't know I was worried. So anyways, um, Throughout this 20 years of my life, navigating the ripple effect, the ongoing trauma, mentally, emotionally, financially, spiritually, everything that comes with the abuse that you in, endure, the devastation. I don't want to say abuse, the devastation you endure when something like this happens to you, okay, is, is, We'll be here all day. I don't want to, I, I can't, I can't get too deep into all of that, but the navigating that is required to protect, to provide, to stay private, to have, feel like you are protected and that you can protect your children, to feel like you have a sense of security, you know, to be able to be in society without being seen in society or heard in society. You know, these, these are all things that are real and, you know, communicating your situation when you're embarrassed, when you're ashamed, when you feel like there's this judgment or opinion that's going to be put forth to you, whether that's in your child's school, at your workplace, uh, anywhere you are, there's, there's so much involved in all of this. And then when you are in need, when you have real needs, you know, where do you go? Who do you talk to? And when you get that need, that, that changes your circumstances. So once your circumstances change, then your needs change again, right? And then as you're going forward, uh, moving forward, it's like your trust is gone. Your trust is, who do you trust? You, you don't even want to trust your neighbor. You're, you're questioning your friends. You're questioning yourself. You know, there's, there's so much, there's so much to it. And 
for those that may not be where I'm at 20 years, you know, 20 years later, you know, I'm here to tell you that, you know, if you don't like who you are as a person, there's your first red flag. If you don't know who you are, if you're confused about who you are, there's another red flag. If you are wondering what the heck you're doing, where you're going and what, what purpose or existence you have, here's another flag. If you're putting, if you have this inner critic that you're convincing yourself, this voice in your head that you're convincing yourself that you're ugly, that you're stupid, that you can't do this, that you can't. If there's any of these negative things that's that's suppressing you, there's your flags. Because yes, you can. Yes, you are. Yes, you will. Yes, yes, you can. These are all the things that, you know, you have to have within yourself to have the strength to get up. When you feel like you are down, it's because you are. Okay. And if you don't have the strength to reach out to other people, then you have to reach within. And mere neurons are a real thing. When I was going through that stuff, the, the next like two, two weeks after that, after that double attempted at homicide, cause that's what it is. It's a double attempt at homicide. Okay. I was crying and crying and crying, trying to figure out what, why, how, and you know what? I realized that's not, I can't, I can't do that. I can't try to figure out why somebody did what they did. I can, and I can't sit here and, and blame myself for not knowing or not being able to see or not being able to prevent what I need, what, what needs to be focused on. Who am I and what do I need to do right now? Right now. Because if I don't do what I need to do right now, I'm going to be stuck in the same place tomorrow and tomorrow and tomorrow and tomorrow. And today's never going to get here. I always would say, I would sit and try to figure out, you know, did. Did he know what he was doing? Does he really think he's a good guy? Did he just get confused? Did he, I would try to figure out what is going on in his mind. Like, did, was he deliberate with everything that he's done? And then I really, I'm like, what is the point? Why do I, I'm not his therapist. I'm not treating him. Like, I don't need to know what happened in his brain. I need to know what's going on in my brain. And where do I go from, from there? To hear you say that is, it's crazy. I was just talking about this yesterday. (laughs) But but that takes, that takes strength to do because when our emotions are so deeply invested and involved, you know, especially if you have children, you know, it's like, why, why didn't I see it? Why couldn't I have prevented it? You know, and that's still a part, even though you're questioning yourself, Ultimately, you're still questioning that behavior. You didn't see it and you couldn't prevent it because you didn't know it was there. So, so yeah, you know, when we go through that devastating period, and like I was saying, you know, when I was going through that time, I actually went down to the mirror. I had no idea what mirror neurons were. I didn't know that there was even mirror work that existed. This wasn't something mental health and stuff like that wasn't even existent during that time. But I was in the mirror and I'm yelling at myself like I was a drill sergeant to my best friend. What are you over here crying about? Get your head out of here, you know what, and snap out of it. You have to do this because your kids are relying on you. And if you don't get this done, I mean, like, oh my gosh, would I have talked to my best friend like that? Probably because if that's what you needed to hear, that tough love, you know, then that's what you were going to get. And that's what I tell people today, because I'll get to what I do today. But, you know, what I tell people today is, you know, how would you defend your child if you needed to against a bully, against, you know, a family member that was antagonizing or, you know, tantalizing them or being, you know, I don't want to say torturing, but, you know, basically annoying the crap out of them. How, how would you defend your kid? You know, because that's the same way you need to defend yourself. The same way you need to talk to yourself, the way you would encourage your, your, your child as a toddler, as an adolescent out on the, out on the field, as a cheerleader or a football player, whatever it is that they're doing, the way that you would defend and do for you and, and, you know, and, and, um, encourage your, your baby is the same way you need to do for you. Right. And it's so hard for whatever reason, it's so hard to, for, well, I know for myself, so I can't speak for everyone, but I know for a lot of people to recognize that, that it's okay to advocate for yourself. And one of the most powerful things that I had, I, because I went into therapy, it was my therapist was like, 
you know what? Let's do a little visualization experiment. Close your eyes and why write down the events that happened to you. Mm-hmm. And, and I was like, you know, I, this is like first or second session of me ever doing therapy. And I was like, this is dumb. And so I'm like, whatever. So I'm imagining it. And she said, okay, now I, what I want you to do is I want you to read it. And the way she said to write it down, she said, don't, don't write it down in first person point of view. Like it's third person. So now I'm reading it and she's like, what do you think? And I'm like that poor woman. And then I kind of, I was like, oh, I have like all these emotions for this woman. And, you know, I want to tell like, you were abused. You went through this. You get up and stop, you know, be strong. It's okay. Like everything that you went through, it's okay to feel all these feelings, but now you need to go. You need to get up. You need to take care of this. And it wasn't until I was able to read it that it was somebody that it happened to somebody else for me to recognize that I needed to tell that to myself. And it's, I I just, I don't know why it is. It's easier to defend another person than it is yourself. I don't know why either, but the moment you recognize that you struggle in that, just pretend you're somebody else and get in the mirror and do it. (laughs) Exactly. (laughs) You know, we, 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 we're making it sound like it's easy. It's not easy until the light goes on in your head that that's what needs to be done. Then it becomes a little bit easier. And if you get to the point where you can do that three times a day, literally, please look it up. Mirror neurons. It's it's a real deal. It's it, it, it's scientifically backed. Like when you're looking at yourself and you're saying these positive things to yourself, there's like this, this energy that's just flowing. And it's, it's, I did it without knowing what it was. Okay. Like it was just so weird. <laughs> I don't know how to explain it. I haven't heard that term, but I, I started doing earlier this year, like these little daily affirmations and yeah. I would do it in the mirror and I was cracking up, Yeah, you know, I'm looking at myself, I'm like, this is so dumb and <laughs> laughing at myself. But then eventually you keep doing it and you're like, oh, well, okay then. And then, then you don't need the mirror. You can just say it, you know, you're walking around and like you feel this little slump, you say these little things to yourself and you're like, okay, you know, I've got this, I've got this. Yes. That's cool. Yes. I'm, and I'm going to say something about that a little bit later because uh, that, that ties into triggers, by the way. So we'll talk about that. You know, um, I want to I want to touch on what you just said as it relates to that timeline of events, right? So when you're looking at a timeline of events and very smart because this is what I talk to, you know, people about as well. When you when you're able to put those timeline of events out there and you can see certain patterns, you know, if you when you get to that place where you're able to identify what's that next behavior going to be, then you realize that you're in this vicious cycle. Right. And the only way that cycle is going to change is if you change, because the definition of insanity is doing the same thing, thinking that the outcome is going to be different. Right. So that is number one. Number two, based on, again, this timeline of events, when you are in it real time and you're seeing, okay, this is what happened in the first three months or the six months, or however long it is, whatever. If you don't have an end date on there for when it's going to stop for you, then is that just going to be an infinite timeline for yourself? When you put that visual in front of you, it's, it, it's different. It's different because when you're in that time capsule, you don't, you can't see it as like an outsider, but when you're physically putting that pen to paper in your, or whatever, you know, the, the mouse to the screen, <laughs> when you have that timeline of events, if you don't put an end date on there, then you have to anticipate that it's going to be ongoing and that's not what you want or where you want to head. Right. And I, I will say sometimes it's hard to even look at a timeline because when you're in the moment, you're just, you're struggling day to day just to survive. You're in complete survival mode, sort of, it's like tunnel vision. You know, it's, it's like when your body goes into shock, all the blood's diverted to your heart and, and your brain to keep you alive. And that's what happens in, in your life. Everything is just diverted into this. How do I get from this day to the next or this minute to the next minute? But yes, I think it is very important to, when you get a chance, when you're able to get up and get that breath of air to sit back and look at that timeline and figure out, okay, I'm in this. Do I want to stay in this forever? 
And that's right. And, and, and what you're talking about is clarity. You're seeking mm-hmm. clarity for yourself at that moment. And and it is you have to look at it as you're getting out of this relationship one of two ways. You're either walking out of it or someone's going to have to carry you out of it. And that's right. you know, it's it's a horrible you know, blunt way to put it, but it's true. Yeah, you're right. And you know what? Acknowledging that is, is 50% already seeking the solution, right? So what, once you acknowledge, then it's time to take the next step to see what are your options. Okay. When you are able to really identify your options, like really take the time to identify your options, you'll realize that there were more options available than what you were thinking. And once you have those options in front of you, it's time to make a choice on which option you're going to take. You may not know what, you know, six months from that choice is going to lead to what that outcome is going to be. You know what? But it's taking action to find out because it's going to be better than the situation that you're in right now, which is what's creating this, you know, um, approach to finding, figuring out what your options are. Okay. You acknowledge your 50% through your solution. You identify your options, you make a choice and you take action. And that's how change happens. Exactly. And I think what's important is a lot of times when people are in it, they think they're alone. They don't understand that this, that this happens to so many people and you're not the only one that has ever done this and not to make it seem like to minimize what you're going through, but to let you know that because you're not the only person going through it, there are resources. Other people have forged ahead and created different resources that weren't available before. And, and I know we're going to get to that in, in just a minute, but um, <laughs> um, we're foreshadowing here. And, but understand you're not alone. There are resources, there are options. And so like what you said, there, there is a choice. You can choose what to do and to recognize because, you know, I had no idea. I, I, I was, you, you mentioned embarrassment. Like I was embarrassed. I don't want to tell anybody. And when you or in that situation, you're very alone because you haven't, you haven't told anybody what's going on. And then you think, okay, how do I do this all by myself? I don't even know where to go. I don't know where to turn. And, but there, there are so many places you can turn. And I think that's really, really important for people to understand. I really hate to stop, but let's take a break here. A Garcia's passion is palpable, isn't it? Make sure to catch the second half of her episode to learn how she has taken that passion to heal and help other victims and survivors. I am going to release that episode next Monday because she has an event coming up that we want you to know about. Thank you for listening. A. Garcia created a profile with links to her website and social media. That profile is attached to her episodes on the one in three website. I have included the link in the show notes. I will be back next week with the second half of her story. Until then, stay strong. And wherever you are in your journey, always remember you are not alone. Find more information, register as a guest, or leave a review by going to the website one in three podcast.com. That's the number one, I N, the number three, podcast.com. Follow One in Three on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter at One in Three Podcast. To help me out, please remember to rate, review, and subscribe. One in Three is a Point Five Pinoy production. Music written and performed by Tim Crow.